or no, was it the book of Battlefield Earth? Or yes. something else. No, that you made a, you made a soundtrack to the book Battlefield he Earth. He had a lot of scams. And it's like the worst selling album of all time. Do you know there was a like like a a jazz fusion album that he produced in the 60s as like the themes of Scientology? And it's like, you know that SpongeBob episode where Patrick <laughs> is listening to the jazz and she's like It's exactly that. Oh, well, it's good to know that Spongebob has more cultural relevance than L. Ron Hubbard does. <laughs> and their jokes are his reality. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, speaking of... Di- <laughs> speaking of Dianetics, yes. Uh, welcome to the Spectator <laughs> Film Podcast. We're not even going to have a transition. Yeah, there. don't think it, don't this say it. This is the world that we live in right now. Yeah. Just Spongebob and Scientology. The title of my autobiography. And the Bye Bye Man. We should do that eventually. Um, no, we should not. I haven't seen it, so I actually shouldn't say that. It's but. actually kind of miserable. I don't know why I suggested it. I, there are better bad movies to do. Yeah. We could do Wish Upon again. We could make a wish to do Wish Upon. Oh, yeah, that's that's another lost episode, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd be down to do Wish Upon. That was stupid enough that... Okay, great. Fun. Today's movie is Wish Upon. Uh, okay, cool. It I'm, was filmed in 1948 by Vittorio De Sica as part of the Italian neorealist movement, and I'm sure many of you have seen it in film school 101 classes. I hope you're excited. Oh, wait, I think you're thinking of Bicycle Thieves. Damn it, I mix those up all the time. Yeah, they're very similar tonally. Hi, everyone, welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. Oh, I'm Austin. And yes, today, as Austin mentioned, we're doing Bicycle Thieves, a 1948 Italian film. Um, that if you're familiar with, it's probably because you took a film class and this was one of the first movies they had you watch. Or not. You could become familiar with it with the way I became familiar with it, which is, well, it's sort of secondhand what you're talking about. I learned about this movie. It was my choice, by the way. Uh, for the first time, I think in high school, I was listening to movie podcasts because I was a movie guy, a movie dude in high school. Were you one of those guys who said that Citizen Kane was one of your favorite movies? No, I wasn't that way in high school, but I think I really came around to it in college where I had that resistance to it because it felt like homework. Yeah. You know? And then I'm like, the more I like allowed myself to like it. Because I remember in high school, like I, I was always doing video projects. I was doing this and like trying to figure out like what kind of movies and what kind of styles I liked. And there's another kid who did that a lot and like, you ask him his favorite movie. He's like, oh, well, Citizen Kane, obviously. Was he like smoking a cigar while doing, well, Citizen Kane, obviously. Cigarette. Man, fuck you. If you say Citizen Kane is your favorite movie, I kind of hate you, unless you're Orson Welles, in which case, cool job on the necromancy. I mean, I have to uh, go with a hard disagreement there, unless you're talking to that kid specifically. Citizen Kane is a great movie. It is a great movie, but it's like, I don't inherently trust you if you say it's your favorite movie, because it just feels that like you looked up what's the best movie of all time, and you're just like, well, now nobody can dispute my taste. I think it depends on the person. Definitely in terms of people who are into movies, if they say Citizen Kane is their favorite movie, that makes sense because it is really fucking good. It is really hard. I just have to see how genuine you are when saying that. Yeah, I guess like I guess I assume that somebody who really is like that is that Citizen Kane is too obvious. So what they're going to they're going to go for the less obvious guy, (laughs) Stanley Kubrick. The Clockwork Orange, Max, is the best movie ever. Everybody goes through that phase, I think, of just like Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Kubrick, or maybe uh, Tarantino who, Kubrick. Who would it be now? Would it be Spike Jones? Would it be uh, Terry Gilliam or uh, who else? Modern, who else we got? Modern directors or like? I mean, just a mixture, right? I'm sure people will grow up fucking loving The Revenant for some goddamn reason. Uh, the Revenant doesn't have that like, like you can't view The Revenant in the same lens that you can view like, because you can be dumb and enjoy Tarantino movies as just like action movies. Uh, like you can be like. You can enjoy a Clockwork Orange. And There's mo- things going on there. Yeah, that have everything fly over your head and just be like, oh, these people in goofy outfits are doing whatever the fuck He's got want. a cod piece. Yeah. Look at that. But there are no cod pieces in The Revenant. Let me tell you. To the detriment of the film. Actually, yes. I think it would be, at least it'd be something I'd be like, wow, there's a cod piece. I'd rewatch The Revenant if there was cod pieces in that, but we're not talking about any of these movies today. We're talking about another movie in which ostensibly nothing happens. Yeah. Uh, Except in this movie, much more happens than The Fucking Revenant. We should stop talking about that god-awful nonsense right now. We're never doing The Revenant, ever. You can mark the, yeah, cross that off your list of... (laughs) 
movies we'll, you hope that we'll we do review eventually. it as a screensaver. Mm-hmm. In which case, I'll say it's great. It's beautiful. But uh, yes, Bicycle Thieves. Sorry. Uh, Bicycle Thieves, Film School 101 movie. Glad we got that out of the way. I chose it this week just because I was thinking it'd be cool to sort of diversify the types of movies we've been doing. And I don't think we've really had an opportunity to do one of those Film School 101 movies, except for Unshien Andalou, which is also kind of like its own case because it's so specific to what it's trying to accomplish. And it's so unlike so many other movies. And uh, that was a fun episode. So I figured, you know, a good place to maybe pick it up was uh, with Bicycle Thieves. It's a very um, sad sort of emotional movie, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, But I felt like it would still be a fun episode to do nonetheless. And weirdly enough, I think because there is this is maybe the biggest movie we've done so far. I don't know if I'd say it's the best. I think I really like To Be or Not To Be. uh, And it would be if I had to choose the best movie we've done so far, I might choose between this and to be or not to be, but I think this might be the quote unquote biggest. Right. And part of that actually, you're forgetting the lost episode of battlefield earth. Clearly oh, the greatest me, movie yes, ever yeah. made. I mean, we were just talking about Dianetics. How could I? Yeah. yeah. Um, Oh man, I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. Uh, <laughs> we should do a wish upon battlefield earth double feature. Yeah. I guess I'm not going to get my fucking rat lunch today. <laughs> uh, sorry, John Travolta. Anyway, Part of this movie being so big, I think, weirdly has uh, taken the pressure off of me doing this episode. So I feel like it's going to be very fun (laughs) instead of like work and being very stressful. I think, you know what? People have talked about this movie uh, so much and I think it's justified. And I think even though it is slightly uh, prisoner to its status as like one of those quote unquote homework movies you have to watch. I think uh, we're still going to have a good time talking about it. And there's going to be plenty of things to talk about. Uh, I'm just really glad that we're able to do this type of movie that is such a monumental, monolithic classic. And of course, I think it's great. Yeah. So, yeah, you kind of hit me out of nowhere with this pick because a lot of times we'll like our picks don't necessarily have to do with each other. But like we'll have talked about them beforehand or like it will be relevant to an aesthetic or a director or an event that's happening. Or Donald Trump will say something and it will trigger some sort of PTSD like yeah. regression in our brains political, to be like Nazis, Nazis, <laughs> political flashbacks. Yes. Yeah, stuff like that. And then you're just like, what about bicycle thieves? And then I had to flashback to my time at Keene state university. Oh boy. <laughs> back in 2011. Um, this fresh college taking all my mandatory film classes. And I think this was like the second or third film we watched in that. And I remember watching it. I remember they were communists and I was just like, cool. And then I haven't watched it since until yesterday when I rewatched it for the pre-screening. What did you think? Um, no, I, I really genuinely enjoyed the film rewatching it, but it got me, it's very well done. It's incredibly emotional. It, like it's that's the thing i wanted to bring up two things that sort of got floating in my mind rewatching watching it okay one how it's very easy to take for granted if a movie is old it will be good in a certain way like if we're still talking about a movie 70 odd years right after it's been released like there's always a presumption that the movie's monumental so that makes it easy to sort of just discount that and Just like, yes, this movie's great. Okay, cool, whatever. Yeah, you can kind of take it for granted. Which brings me to my second point Mm -hmm. of how do you, if you are a film student or even somebody who's studied film cursory in an academic thing, like you took a film class because you thought it would be an easy A in college, how do you revisit the movies that you were forced to watch for homework, for an assignment, in some ways that made them drudgery? Right. And try to revisit them as movies to enjoy and take something out of, which I find very hard. Like you heard me going off being all snarky on people who say their favorite movie is Citizen Kane. Right. And I think a lot of that is because I'm so used to being surrounded by people who have no knowledge of film outside of their academic courses. So as soon as they get to the class and they're just like, okay, so this is considered to be the greatest movie ever made. They're like, oh, Well, if I say this is my favorite movie, then that means I'm smart and I understand movies. Pseudo intellectual approach where there's not like there's no thought thought process going to it's just other people have said this is the best movie. So if I think it's the best movie too, that makes me on their level. And now let me play devil's advocate. Please do. To a certain extent, 
I understand that thinking because that is how all humans learn everything. Yeah. That's how we were babies. We have to learn how, how to say shit by watching our dad go, <laughs> right? May I take your hat, sir? May I take your hat, sir? This is going to devolve into a things. SpongeBob commentary. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I wonder if there's a SpongeBob parody of this. There's all sorts of TV shows that do parodies of this movie yeah. and its plot, but um, such is the cultural impact of this movie. But I, I think I understand, you know, to a certain extent, the need for mimicry and, and sort of, uh, you know, burden, burnishing yourself with like false opinions until you learn actually how to fill those shoes. Well, no, it's a right? necessary step. It's just at what point do annoying. you make the transition? Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to stop you from being a pretentious teenager. <laughs> no, right? and we've talked about this before, like the people who talk about how Tarantino is their favorite director yes. without understanding any of the like the cinematic techniques that he uses and also under not understanding how insufferable of a person Quentin Tarantino is, but like it's it's one of those things. So I tried very hard yesterday to just watch this movie, which wasn't that hard because I hadn't seen it and uh, 2011? So what, eight years? Yeah. Like, yeah. So it had been a while, so I had forgotten a good portion of it. But I tried to just separate myself completely. I didn't read any articles on this until after I watched the movie, which is not something I normally do. Normally I read critical reviews and will try to not view it through their lens, but like just be aware of how other people view this. I tried to watch this movie completely new, completely just taking it in as I would any movie I would see in theaters. And honestly, I think in general, you might want to do that for the first time for every movie, just because I found a genuine enjoyment from watching it that way. Yeah. And I'm excited to be rewatching it today so I can look at, at it through a slightly more critical lens. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's easy to forget that film is entertainment. Yes. Like, and even this movie can be entertaining. Yeah, no, and I, I would say it is. And while critical analysis is great and all, and like, it's the entire point of our podcast in the end at some time, like you need to remember that these are made to entertain you. They are made to make you think about certain things. They are made to make you feel different ways, but like they are a form of entertainment. And if a movie has been introduced to you purely to be dissected academically, I would say, give it some time take a step back and try to rewatch it just as a form of entertainment and see how the, it affects you that way. We should, I can't wait until we do a Godard movie. That's going to be great. We're going to put that theory to the test. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, there are some movies that are made to just like be miserable and eight hours long because of that, but we, we'll see. But you know, I, I think it's interesting that you bring up that point in terms of this movie specifically and just a neo, the idea of a neorealist film. Yeah. Do you want to, define that term because I'm not super familiar with the scene. Okay, so neorealism like any sort of academic film term is uh well, it's it's sometimes hard to define and people argue about it. But essentially part of our approach for doing this episode is going to be looking at the movie less in reference to like this preconceived trapped in amber notion of what a neorealist movie is. Cuz from what I understand it was like a film movement uh, with themes that were popular in Italy immediately after the end of World War II. Yes. And it really, it's not even an entire movement. It's more just like a moment. Yeah. Because like there's like 10 movies that are like considered neorealists. It depends on who you ask, yeah. right? This is where the debate comes in. Sometimes it's only seven. Yeah. Other times it's maybe like a dozen. And then other times it's like, oh, they made like 40 or 50. And it's like, what? That's a lot of, that's a big difference, yeah. right? But really, it's we, almost like genres and movements are defined by like arbitrarily. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately, we can point to really a six or seven solid movies that make up the movement. You have the war trilogy, right? Which would be Rome Open City, Paisan, uh, Germany Year Zero, directed by Roberto Rossellini. You have La Terra Trema, directed by Lucino Visconti. Uh, you have Shoeshine, and you have Bicycle Thieves, and you have Umberto D all of which directed by Vittorio De Sica. And for most people, I think that is going to cover cover the entire span of, of neorealism for the most part. It only lasted several years. So um, this movie, I think, is considered by a lot of people to be the like popular height of the, of the movement. And even if this is necessarily their most favorite movie, um, 
in that movement, I think people will consider it to be the most like perfect formally. This is a very tight movie, right? And yeah. it executes everything it's trying to do perfectly. So I think people really do point to this as the ultimate neo realist film. And I think also it might have been the most popular in terms of having a lot of staying power. But uh, part of our approach in terms of doing this is going to be looking at this movie less in reference to these neo realist ideas. And more just looking at how it actually uses artifice to tell a story, because it's less the idea that, you know, um, neorealism is a, a movement that 100% eliminates artifice, and more that neorealism like, deploys cinematic artifice in a way to create a new language of realism. It's still artificial in many ways, but it uses that and the uh, tricks of the trade of cinema to create a new language for what is realism. It's not that it's completely unmediated because for one thing, that's impossible. But for another thing, they're still using a lot of recognizable sort of studio techniques, right? And it's not like everything is uncontrived in this movie. Oh no, of course not. That's the case for everything. And I'm, yeah. if you want to, deeper analysis of the other way. I'm sure you'll put some sources in the show. Notes oh yeah. We're going to have a ton of sources for this movie. Everybody and their mother has written about this movie. Yeah. Except so for my mom. That's why we kind of want to <laughs> distance ourselves from that criticism. Cause there are 80 bajillion yeah. other things and probably said better than we could. I so. mean, really the ultimate thing for me with this movie is that this is a great, really an amazing movie in terms of balancing plotting with character. There's very little plot, but it's great on character. It has great performances and it's so tightly organized in terms of those two things that I think they're, okay, if you were, I often, maybe this is a mistake, but I often think of movies in reference to how could I learn from them if I was making a movie, right? And I think there is no genre of movie from which you could not take something from this movie, especially if you're telling like a linear story following characters, you know? If you're going to make something like Meshes of the Afternoon, maybe that's a little bit different. But if you're making any sort of straightforward film dinner that's following Andre. a character. <laughs> Maybe even <laughs> Dinner with Andre could learn from this movie. Not that that's a bad movie. By the way, do you want to do that? I have it right on the shelf over there. Uh, That'd be the ultimate That's a conversation for <laughs> another day. podcast episode in yeah, history. We'll, we'll just be eating the entire time. Would we... Would here's, How about this? If we do that episode, we have to have the script in front of us and just say the lines doing impersonations of Wall Sean. That might be the most insufferable thing I... <laughs> Ever, I, I think my sing along idea was a better idea <laughs> than your sing along idea. Yeah, you don't remember Reef of the Genetic Opera when I, you had to threaten me with a knife not to sing along the entire movie. I never remember Reef of the Genetic Opera. I'm gonna keep keeping that in your psyche, but let's uh, get started on a movie that I think we both want to keep in our psyche forever. Yeah. He's Now, Max, I believe you want. I want to ride my bicycle. That's right. I want to ride my bike. I'm glad I, I knew where you were going to go with that. Yeah. I think that's why we make such a good film podcast, Austin, is because we're always on the same wavelength without any hassles in between. Yes. It's, it's so wonderful. I do find it weird that, like, Freddie Mercury, one of the, like, the most, like, flamboyant out there bisexual queens ever, was... Like all of his songs have been co-opted by the straights to like for like stadium music to sing about fat bottom girls. You mean? Well, he's a bisexual. People like to forget that, but like no, but like yes, but I mean the men yeah. hear that and they're like, yeah, that um, we are the champions. Like, <laughs> it'd be funny if this movie opened with "We Are the Champions," <laughs> just the ultimate like "fuck you" to these people. <laughs> We are the champion. The remake that's coming out soon. Oh my god. That's like the ultimate joke remake movie. It's the <laughs> Bicycle Thieves is starring Vin Diesel. No, starring Bruce Willis and what's her face? Uh Ronda Rousey. Pretty woman. <laughs> Little Miss Sunshine. Or no. Uh Aaron Brockovich. Why can't I remember her name? I don't Julia know. Julia Roberts. It's a joke from a movie called The Player. In which uh, uh, a, a producer, it's a movie about how scummy Hollywood producers are. And um, one of them 
is is proposing perhaps it's implied to remake they call it the bicycle thief but we know it's called bicycle thieves in reality and that's an important distinction a distinction we can already see on display here we begin the movie with the image of a crowd which will be very important throughout this movie one of the key dialectics throughout this movie is the contrast between the individual and the crowd between the one thing and the many of that thing And we see it first here with this crowd of people looking for work. And then our hero, Antonio, Antonio Ricci, which is a John Smith type name, by the way. Yes, it's like Italian. John Smith. Exactly. Yeah. So already here, we're seeing a lot of interesting things. Part of the reason why I think this was so striking at the time is because a lot of the direction used in this movie doesn't necessarily explicitly point to a place you're supposed to be looking. There's lots of documentary style shots in the sense that De Sica will not explicitly try to make you look at one thing or the next. He will just show you lots of things going on. And he doesn't use the sort of um, deep staging framing techniques of somebody like Orson Welles to do that. He'll usually have an open aperture and the, the focus will be shallower and that's how we'll direct your focus, which is still a certain type of artifice. He's just not necessarily going to use it with geometry in the frame. It's an interesting but different approach. And already here, we're seeing uh, the the sort of problem present itself. And let me ask you, based on his introduction, what do you think of Antonio here so far? Um, well, we haven't had much of, like, we'd see him, like, thankful that he has a job, like, despite this crowd of people just being like, what the fuck? Why aren't there any jobs for us? Fat cat with a cigar in his mouth. Yeah. Um... So we haven't gotten a good look into him yet. He's thankful, but I don't know. We haven't gotten a good read into his personality. I think he's supposed to be just sort of, like you said, his name is a very John Smith type thing. Right. So I think he's kind of just there to, for post-World War II Italians to project he, on. It is very important that he is normal. Yeah. But also I think part of that is the the hidden detail of his character that we get. And again, it's a neorealist thing. And we can... I want to talk about so many things going on in this opening. But the first thing I want to mention is the first introduction of his character is that he's aloof. Yeah. You know, he's not looking for a job the way he should. He's just has his hand in like a puddle or something. He's playing with grass. Right. And the guy has to go find him. A guy we can assume was maybe somebody, one of his buddies from the military based on his military cap. And then immediately he comes over here and he starts complaining to his wife and lets her carry these two barrels of water, right? Of course, we get the reaction shot, which informs his character more where the moment he realizes he's doing it. Oh, I'm just an idiot. Yeah. And I really do appreciate it. That's one of the things I love most about this movie is how it does not show character through dramatic behaviors. It shows it through momentary behaviors that are utterly unimportant to anything. And I think that's a big takeaway for me of what, how this movie works so well and how it establishes character and plot so well is that the true moments of emotional complexity aren't happening in like grand sweeps of dramatic emotional engagements. It happens in throwaway moments. It happens in banal moments that you forget. Yeah. No, that's something I was noticing rewatching this. Like even early on, like, I'm almost more interested in like the stories of every background character Mm -hmm. just because like you can feel the pain and suffering and desperation of everybody around them. And this just like collapsed occupied economy. Like, yeah. And and the movie is great at doing that because it seems to imagine the life story of literally every character being something akin to his struggle right now. Yes. And everybody in part of this movie's project is showing you how, No matter who you come into contact with, there is that story behind them. That's part of the interesting thing when you see the duplication of all of the one versus the many in that dialectic, right? Where it's like, no matter how many people you see, they all have some sort of story like this, right? So when we go to get the bicycle back from the pawn shop, we see the rack of bicycles. Or even more noticeably, we see she's going to pawn her bed sheets here. It was her dowry gift, right? That's a very emotional thing. That's why she's so upset. By the way, she gives an amazing performance, Maria. I think all the performances are amazing, but I think she, it it might be easier to overlook her because 
as we go throughout the movie, the son and the father will become more and more isolated from her, right? And she, she will disappear from the movie at a certain point once they really start looking for the bicycle. But I think it's not to be neglected how good she is in this movie. Yeah. No, well, it's... it's you can tell that she kind of came from a silent film acting era, almost, or like a po- immediately post, just because of the acting style. No, I'm not saying that she did personally. Right. I'm saying that she's like acting because she's like very physical, very just like... I'm going to let my emotions be used. Yeah. Shown through my physical actions rather than like expressing them with a tone of voice. Well, or, that is again, another thing with the uh, neorealist style yeah. acting, so to speak. And these were, he cast all non-actors famously for this yeah. movie specifically because, you know, Vittorio De Sica felt that, you know, an actor who was trained would mediate their performance somehow. Right. And again, just this is just another example. We're watching them pawn the sheets right now, and she says, she gives us the information that it's the dowry, and then they have to ask for just a little bit more, right? Yeah. And the fact that the camera holds on this man with the binoculars. There's so many, like, special objects Other people for people. are doing it, too. Yes. But also, that guy looks like Mike Staclasa. I was literally just going to make that <laughs> joke, and I'm just like, uh, Austin will get mad if I derail the pod. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's just so weird. I didn't notice that before. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't look at him. A oh, b- my God. A bicycle. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> He's looking for a VHS tape. Uh, Jesus Christ. But anyway, I, I just wanted to point out again how interestingly and emotionally complex that moment is when it's just a throwaway moment. And that's really where the neorealist thing comes into play. It's not even necessarily so much about the aesthetic so much as it is focusing on the throwaway moments. This one shot is fucking amazing. Yes. Just because like you see how much extra shit they have, how many people have sold their stuff. And exactly. They, ha- they have it all sitting here, not doing anything. They could yes. give it to everyone, but now we still have to maintain this like capitalistic, just shit collapse. To Failure comment. of bureaucracy. Yeah. yeah. And I think that shot is obvious to me until it pans up. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, oh, we get it. There's a lot of them. Everybody has to do it. And then it pans up and you're like, oh my fucking God. And the guy climbs it. Just casually too. It's not just like, oh, I have to do this again. He's done it before, you know. And again, these are, if if one of the things that's been talked about to death in terms of this movie is how the overall plot of this movie is like four bullet points and that's it, right? Yeah. Gets job bicycle, right? Loses bicycle due to theft. Looks for bicycle. Tries to steal bicycle. Spoilers. Over. Movie over. Right? And uh, between the third and the fourth plot point, there's about 50 minutes. Right? Yeah. Not a lot happens in this movie. And uh, a big, big sort of talking point in terms of discussing this movie is how this movie is all about filling in those blank spaces. But you can even do that on a more micro level from scene to scene. We're going to see throughout this movie... There's lots of in-between moments that would seem to be cut from more expedient movies. You know what I mean? I'm imagining a version of this movie that's kind of like a Hollywood movie that is about the same subject matter and also people who are not very well off trying to make it by through this bicycle, right? But they will focus on making it more dramatic. They will cut certain moments to make way for more dramatic moments, and this movie doesn't do that. It focuses on the moments that are awkward and weird, like asking the guy for a little bit more money, right? We're going to spend a solid, what, four minutes in that sequence and then just seeing how many bikes there are and seeing all the linens, right? In a, if you were doing a Hollywood version of this movie and still committed to doing it uncompromisingly, I think they would still cut that scene because it's just not perceived as important. You know what I mean? Whereas the real interesting thing about this movie is how the unimportant content becomes the absolute like vital backbone of this movie. A woman? (laughs) We've got to go see a woman. There aren't many of those in Italy. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, as we all know. Um, Why do you think the Italians are so thirsty all the time? Oh, God. It's because there's five women in the entire country. Yeah, you know, this movie is not nearly as bad as... No, it's not. ...as uh, many other movies, I imagine, from the time. Not that they were making too many movies at this time. This is still very... Just in general, for Italian films, though, you know who I'm a slut for giallo films, uh, like... But there's like a lot of Jello films where you're just like, woo, portrayal of women is not great. I'll interrupt that conversation for a moment here. Mm. This shot is very interesting to me because this moment is like triggering for me. 
Do you feel that as well? Yeah. You know the movie is called Bicycle Thieves, and you get the shot where it's just sitting down in the corner, and then you see some kids walk up to it. Well, you had the little moment before, too, of like him carrying the bike into the office yes. and the guy being like, well, what are you doing? What are you worried about? He's just so happy and naive, yeah. right? Of course, that's also part of the interesting thing that I was going to bring up with this scene. And I think the scene sort of engages you with it on that level in a way that you might not have if you're just watching him. Beforehand, you might have just thought, oh, he's so happy, right? But yeah. now when you're watching this scene, I don't think there's a way to watch the scene and forget that the movie is called Bicycle Thieves. You understand what I mean? Yeah, no. And you're just like, what are you doing? Get back to the bike. Yes. We've seen no reason for that, right? And notably here, we're going to get some noticeable deep staging here, which does not happen throughout often throughout this movie, right? And even though we have to shift focus to get there, it's noticeable to me that we have that framed behind him as he's going up here. It seems very conspicuously to be making us remember that he's leaving the bicycle alone right now. And I think that's a very important part of this movie in terms of being a key scene to get us in his shoes emotionally and get us to the point where we are, you know, honestly engaging with the emotional entanglement of what do you do when you're really desperate and also you need this bicycle, but someone's taking it. I think that scene is very important to setting up the theft later. Yeah. Obviously it has to carry the thread, but I think that moment is very covertly effective because the purpose of the scene is something entirely different, right? But really where it hits home is like the tension you feel suddenly that he's leaving the bicycle alone and you know he shouldn't because this is called Bicycle Thieves and you've seen his apartment. Even though it's a bunch of rooms and I would love to live in that. Well, no, that apartment doesn't have running water. We know that because they have to go to the well and they have to bring it up the stairs, right? Yeah. Oh, he has children. Ooh, new facts. But yeah, like you can't separate from the fact that like this movie is called Bicycle. <laughs> you so like, yeah. But anytime that the bike is left alone, you're just like, oh fuck. Yes, it's triggering. Yeah. But I think, again, I think that's very like sneaky move because it very much gets you in his shoes, you know, and it gets you thinking along the lines of somebody who's desperate in this world. You know what I mean? Like, there's a difference between watching this movie and understanding and being like, wow, they're doing a really good job of establishing how desperate people are and how hard of a time it is for everybody just to get by, right? Yeah. And I think it does that great in, in the scene at the pawn shop, right? But there's a difference between that and literally feeling it in your gut, which is what that scene does when you see him have to walk away from his bike for a few minutes. Yeah, You feel it in your gut, and now you're like, God, people are desperate for this bike. And she was going to pay a fucking psychic to get, yeah, like, I don't know what how fit much 50 lira was worth. I have no then, idea. But, like, you think you might want to spend that on food instead. <laughs> oh, that's a funny moment. It's yeah. like the little boy seems like a real adult Italian. Yeah. He's a big mechanic already. I think that also has to do with part of the staying power of this movie is how cute the, the lead boy performance is. Yeah. I think people love that. Uh, and he's shouting like an Italian. He's very angry about certain things. And uh, he has a, a, a very cute, chubby face that I think grandmas love, right? I want a pinch. They love the flesh, right? You look like a cop. <laughs> you bastard. Oh, you Italians. But interesting thing. So we're talking about how the movie sort of makes you uneasy, Right in that moment, yeah. When you're when you're he's supposed to be looking at the psychic, right? But then all you can think about is the fact that he left the bike alone. Likewise, I think the movie does an interesting thing in terms of genre here, which is again genre we might equate with a certain type of artifice. So people, I, I feel like tend to discuss this a little bit less. But I think it's interesting to look at how this movie is playing out with a lot of happy scenes right now, you know and joyous moments and it's kind of playing out like a romance in some kind in, of in yeah. a certain capacity. We get to see them. Oh, look, <laughs> we just threw a baby on the bed. He looks like he's going to Hogwarts. Why? Cause of the scarf. Also important detail. I don't know if they're going to close that door, but you'll see there's a horseshoe on it. 
Yeah. They are a superstitious family. Well, yeah, we saw, well, that's probably just an Italian thing, but we saw <laughs> cro- we saw crosses on, like, every wall in the house before. And so, like, I mean, they are Italian. Very, <laughs> very Catholic-y. Um, oh, man, shots like this are just great. Shots like that capture the emotion of what's going on so perfectly. Well, and, like... But this it, was filmed in Italy, like just locally, right? Like it's yeah. This was filmed on location in Rome. Yeah, so like it's interesting, like because if we're gonna talk about the obvious uh, twenty twenty one yeah, remake that's coming out for this movie, yes, obviously. Like I think that if we're doing the Hollywood version of that, it's like they would make eighty million times more effort to show like bombed out buildings. Yes. And just like how utterly destroyed Italy was after world war two. I think it's very important that they don't do that. Yes. Um, not just as in terms of it being like maybe a, a less soup, like a more superficial way to show that people are suffering. Yeah. But it's also, it abandons the emotional reality of this movie. Vittorio De Sica has described this movie as an exercise in empathy before anything else. And I think he's right. I think this movie focuses on the empathy if the damage to the city does not matter to our lead character, then it's not, it does not, does not belong in this movie. If like, I think like right there in the way distance, you could see like a bombed out building. Sure. But, like it's not like the camera focused on it. It just happened to be in the shop by mistake. And yeah. It's not. And part of the important thing of this movie. And I think again, part of its staying power is that it's non-specific in that way, you know? And I think they go out of their way to avoid giving specific dates as well because of that. This is a movie that is very specifically timeless in a, in a special way. Again here, we have a slightly triggering moment where why is the camera following these two kids looking for money? What's up with this? You know what I mean? He was just mistreated by his partner. Is the but kid it's, it's almost like a Chekhov's gun thing. Yeah. You know, where it's like those kids give you no reason to be suspicious of them or think that they're going to steal the bicycle. Neither did the kids playing with the rocks. But you know this movie is called Bicycle Thieves, you know? So when the camera pays attention to them in a weird way, it's a little bit, your ears go up. Well, no, it's like if the movie was called Little Kid Stabs Me in My Side. (laughs) Like, little kid. You're always waiting for that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, as a spectator film podcast, we are happy to announce our first film we're producing is... A Little Kid Stabs You in the Side. Yeah. Expected uh, 2021. Of course, the, the, the middle of fact, January. We, and we're going to choose a, a viewer or a listener as our lead protagonist. Our, our lead supporter on Patreon will uh, get the starring role in the movie. So if you give us $1 a month. <laughs> are our bad jokes more important than this scene? Probably. Yeah, okay. I would say so. So you're going to get stabbed in the side. Yes, by a child. Yes. Um, and if the sequel is popular, then you're going to get stabbed twice. Yes. Uh, and there's going to be a two in the title instead of some other letter. <laughs> This S will be a two. Stabbed in the twied. <laughs> Stabbed in the twied. Oh, man. And there we go. It's the thief of the and bicycle. Your, and your acting career will be off to just as good of a start as this man's poster career. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we didn't mention it, but one other thing that people tend to point to as a fun little detail is how when he's getting the instruction from the other poster guy, how he's talking about how you should remove the wrinkles, right? Um, it yeah. seems to be a backhanded comment about Hollywood movies and specifically the, uh, white telephone films that the, uh, the neorealist movie was, uh, movement was sort of famously developed in opposition to as like some sort of fascist fantasy that is denying the actual cultural goings on of the city and, uh, well, just Italy at large and the struggles of the, the common people. So again, uh, when they say, make sure there are no wrinkles, it seems to be maybe a comment on those types of movies not addressing a a type of objective reality in the same way. I don't know. Even Uh, if they're about the same subject matter. Yeah, I guess. Should we start talking? Like, this is the monumental scene. This is like him, everything setting in, realizing that like this good thing that he just had and they gave up things for is just snatched away from him. It's the... So suddenly. Yes. Uh, how did it strike you? Um, I mean, yet again, you can't separate the fact that this movie is called Bicycle Thieves. 
Right. So you right. knew it was coming. You knew it's coming, yeah. but like it still does hit you very hard. It's just like I think it does a really great job of you being like, oh fuck. Yeah. You know? Everybody has had a moment where they're just like, well, I'm now I'm just fucked. You yeah. know? Even if it is something as, you know, potentially trivial as like, I'm not gonna get this paper in on time now. Yeah. You know, everybody know can relate to that sort of feeling. And I think part of why it hits so well is again because we have those moments setting it up and we know it's called bicycle thieves. And it I think it's interesting because generically we're talking about how the opening is sort of like a romance. It really does hit you as like that being a lie, you know? But to me, that sort of also plays about how that being a lie in all circumstances almost. You know what I mean? Where this movie is like for every movie you see where there's a romance, just know that it's also a lie, right? And to me, in my mind, that seems somehow connected to him being somebody who's putting up this poster of Rita Hayworth, right? No wrinkles. The romance movie is where she belongs, right? But this Bicycle Thieves seems to be implying that that type of narrative is inherently not faithful to the reality of what's going on. Yeah, okay, and we saw some troops there, some... Reminders of the the police. Yes. And again, we get, we're going to get some more interesting uh, dialectical, um, you know, oppositions here between the one and the many. We're going to see a lot of uh, visually. I think that that uh, idea, that conflict between those two things, plays out a lot in the background of a lot of scenes where you see one object that is repeated frequently in the in the background whether it's geometrically or just the object itself like in this shot we have a lot of repeated geometry between these squares that are just filled with paper these like little cubbies right we don't know what's in them but i think it really does a good job of uh communicating how frequently i do like reports that. are made yeah and i like that oh just the bicycle yeah that's a key line for a lot of people reading this movie where again it's it's this it's his entire world it's yes his entire livelihood right and it's now it's depends not on it. even in the newspaper no, it's not even one line in the newspaper. It's, it's not even worth it to talk about at the police station. Like, it's just worthless. And again, I think, you know, I keep comparing this to some sort of hypothetical idea of like a Hollywood version of this movie, right? And in that movie, I think it could also be good. <laughs> Famously, uh, when Vittorio De Sica was looking for money for this movie, he turned to uh, David O. Selznick, I believe, and uh, Selznick wanted to put in Cary Grant <laughs> into really? this movie. It would have been a very different movie. He said, yeah. no, thank God. But ultimately, in that movie, even if it is about the same subject matter and they're trying to communicate the same sort of thing, they would do it in a very different way. And I don't think you get scenes like this, uh, right? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, that's the most Italian thing ever. <laughs> There's some very Italian extras in this when they're, like, shaking their hands at people yeah. where they have, like, I don't know what they call it. It's like a very, it's like a limp wrist, like, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry if I'm insulting you Italian listeners, but... Yeah, all, all of you. All of our listeners are Italian. We'll have no listeners after this. <laughs> They're trying to learn English through this podcast, which is a terrible idea because we barely speak it. And you just have the depressing silhouettes walking into the distance. We speak it frequently, to correct you. I'm, I'm, you just misspoke, right? We speak it frequently, just not well. Did I say frequently? I, didn't, I thought I said, said it. barely. Yeah, I said we barely speak it. Well, this is exciting. I'm glad you pedantically decided to pick that up, Austin. I was trying to make some sort of self-aware joke about how we can't even say things correctly in English when we're talking about how we can't do that. So back to Bicycle Thieves, an immensely <laughs> important film. <laughs> but, uh, but again, I don't think we get that interesting scene, right? Where what happens in that scene? We get a development between the relationship between Antonio and Bruno as they're coming home from, from work, right? But Which mirrors the scene in the beginning. But I feel like if you're comparing it to this hypothetical Hollywood movie, the big climactic scene, the drive that home, would be an argument between him and his wife where they're freaking out. And we get yeah. that too. But in this version, we get it after we see him slowly come home. We see him have to use public transportation, right? And I also think part of the interesting trick this movie pulls to really hammer home the consequences of this is how there's also somehow a time-sensitive nature to everything, right? And I think it does a really good job of exploring this idea that when you are 
when you lack a certain type of, by the way, if you look closely in the crowd, we'll see the cigar chomping fat cat, I believe you called him. Yes. Attending this party meeting. And we'll talk more about this party meeting and how it might compare to other institutions that are shown throughout the rest of the movie. But I think part of the interesting thing with this movie showing the public transportation stuff and in general, just how many moments are devoted to them walking throughout the streets and going from one place to the next, it helps demonstrate how a lack of financial security is something that will just eat away at time. Does that make sense? Like he's not a guy who has free time. Yeah. And I I think it does that in a very specific way where it's not just that he has to devote more time to getting from one place to the next because he doesn't have his own means of transportation. It's because he has a time sensitive situation, but he has to search through an entire city to do it. It's impossible. Yeah. Where the fuck do you even begin? Yes. And also the fact of this being on top of how much he would have to work to make money anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he has to work a full day anyway to get that money, but he can't do that. Now he has to do this on top of it, right? It's like, it's like the, it's the ultimate, like, I don't know, response to this idea in America that we have frequently of picking yourself up by your bootstraps is that there's literally no time to do that for many people. Where are you going to find yeah, the Yeah, how time? are you going to pull up yourself up from your bootstraps when you've had to sell your bootstraps for a bicycle at yes. this point? Like, yeah, like, like, and people just working multiple, multiple jobs, right? There's something about the way this movie structures the, the theft of the bicycle and how they search for it that really communicates the desperation in terms of, like, time being a commodity that they don't have, you know? They cannot afford the time they need to look for this, Right. And that's why their time is over by the end, because they have one day, Sunday, one day, and then it's over. He's got to go back to work on Monday. Piazzi Vittorios. And again, they're uh, they're introducing that stuff right now. And I believe this is going to be uh, Maria's last scene in the movie. Don't start whining. That this movie gets Italian here. I think she is entitled to tear up a little bit. Yeah, like you look like a. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, she sold her dowry to pay for the bicycle. You fuck. And the really weird thing about the realism of this interaction that I feel like this movie sells very well is how this movie really does communicate that he chastises her about whining because of his own insecurity about the bike. Yeah. It's very interesting how it does that, whether it's the performance or just the, the way in which they cut back and forth, you can tell that he's taking it out on her. Right. And I think this movie does an excellent job of establishing his character in that way. He's not a great guy, Antonio. <laughs> no, he's, he's not. just a normal guy, you know, <laughs> You got the plays and the communists. That's another interesting thing, right? If we're talking about free time, right? Yeah. This is now just another way in which they are being distinguished from the crowd, right? They often travel from one institution to the next in which people are devoting time to do it, to gathering or something, right? In this, they have the play they're setting up, right? Not only does that help emphasize the direness of their situation because they no longer have time to do that, it's interesting that every time they go into one of these institutions, they are disruptive, or at least they're perceived as disruptive. You know what I mean? I guess, yeah. Like, he goes asking for that guy, and he's like, excuse me, can you shut the fuck up? I'm sorry. I know you have to say, I'm sure, listen, (laughs) what did Kanye say? I'm I'm going to let you you finish, finish, but but shut the fuck up. (laughs) I'm old. My bicycle is the most important. I'm thing old, of everybody. All time. I'm sorry, I forgot that. That that's to be fair. I mean, that you're, happened you're 20 old, years ago. You're so. old to reference it at this point. So. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to take that back. That happened 50 years ago. That happened in the mid 1860s. That happened just after Bicycle Thieves came out. In the 1860s. Yeah, and it's just barely less important than this movie. So I can only remember one or the other. It was Kanye West at uh, General Lee's surrender <laughs> from Maddox <laughs> Courthouse. Jesus Christ. Yo, General Lee, like, I'm really happy for you. <laughs> I'm 
Russell oh Finch. Oh my god. <laughs> It's just, the, just the armies standing there silently. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but Ulysses S. Grant is the greatest general of all time. <laughs> he still got the glasses. <laughs> yeah. Except it's like those iron curtains that you see in the iron like battleships. But anyway, fun fact about this movie. I like these trucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry because normally you'd just be like well did you know that actually those trucks were a brand that started in uh, pre-fascist Italy and it's nice to see them there to see that we're post-fascist Italy and it's, no I like those trucks they look cool they look like giant I, tubes I want a toy of them they look, them into my they other look like trucks. somebody who is we're going to reference Spongebob again it looks like those trucks that drove around and made everything chrome. Wait, was it a truck that did that, or was it just a tentacle from somewhere? Oh, I whatever. Think, I Fuck think it was it. just a tube. Yeah, a tube. Was foop. Well, I imagine that truck is on the other end, and that that gentleman. It's the U.S. I don't know. I know His name is not Picacho, but it's something similar. Because I know we dumped a shit ton of money into Germany and Japan to rebuild them. I'm not sure if we did it as much for uh-huh. Italy. Ah, very interesting. You mentioned that. Yeah. In reading up on this movie and just reviewing some of the things on it. Uh, one of the things I learned is, and part of the reason why you might say Italian neorealism sort of came to the end. Um, and it came to, to the, to an end, people might say prematurely because Italy did have a big economic boom, right? But it was a few years after this, right? It didn't even really begin to start until the fifties. Right. And even then it was, it was a, it was probably a decade after world war two based on my knowledge. But part of it was, this movie didn't like the image, or I'm sorry, Italy, the government did not like the image that neorealism had earned Italy. People would say it's like dirting, uh, airing dirty laundry. Yeah. Right? So I say fuck you to those people, obviously. But um, part of the interesting thing was they discouraged these types of movies being made because they thought it reflected poorly on the country. And specifically, they thought it was repellent to investors and also, the U.S. government, there was at this point in time, specifically in 1948, this was a crucial point in time in Italian history, where the communist government had a real opportunity to make itself the prominent government. Yeah, like most countries in Europe afterwards. Yes. Bit like That's also prominently seen in France post-World War II, because mm-hmm. you had... The con- you had the government completely surrendered to the Nazis. You had vast swaths of the country destroyed. You had terrible labor conditions. So you had a gri- yeah, <laughs> very high rising tide of uh, communist sentiment rising in there. And if the U.S. hadn't spent a bajillion dollars rebuilding the entire thing, it's very likely it would have taken hold. Well, here's the other thing. If they hadn't promised to spend that much money rebuilding things, yeah, true. it would have taken hold. And that's sort of what started to happen in Italy, based on my research, is that there were perhaps threats that the money from the Marshall Plan would not be rolling into Italy or it would be delayed and people could not afford that, you know? Yeah. So uh, you have movies like this, which even though they don't necessarily espouse a a uh, communist political stance, they're very much they acknowledge focused it. on the people who would, who that type of political attitude teams focuses on. Yeah. And right? this movie acknowledges that they're there. Yes. But it's not just like, Oh, well maybe in a communist utopia, you wouldn't need to worry because everybody's guaranteed a bicycle. So you wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> in to- fact, that's part of the reason why the, uh, the left in, in Italy seemed to be critical of this movie is because it didn't seem to offer some sort of solution. collective solution. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just sort of like, wow, doesn't it suck how hopeless everything is? Oh, here's a very, another very Italian moment where these people are barking at them. When I went to, when I went to Rome, it was literally exactly like this. I don't know if every, everyone else's experience is like that, but they could tell I was a tourist and they started saying things at me in Italian, like shaking their hands, like, yeah, but, uh, look at this watch. Look, you see this watch? You got a lovely mother, kid. Listen, this watch, <laughs> I made it for you. <laughs> right? It was some shit like that. And I just thought it was very amusing. Oh, man, this is such a great moment. Because we see that at no point is the social interaction clean. And I think that's another interesting uh, sort of 
differentiation from what we might expect from a Hollywood version of this is that I don't think in a Hollywood movie, the storytellers would be so willing to put somebody like Cary Grant or their protagonist in situations that are like straight up awkward. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's a difference between that and like the type of social interaction that we might find in a Hitchcock movie where somebody is misunderstood to be guilty of something, right? And they're perceived as being guilty, but we know they're wrong or right or whatever. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to interrupt myself and just point out how creepy it is that this fucking pedophile is creeping on him. And that's 100% the the implication too. (laughs) Yeah. Just look how much fucking scum is running. Yeah. This movie just, it feels dirty. This movie did run into troubles with uh, Joseph Breen and the uh, oh, yes. censorship service in the U.S. Oh, God, I love this moment. You know what the really interesting thing about this is? Is how Antonio's like veracity in getting the bike back makes him feel so- somewhat guilty about going against this guy, right? But also, based on the guy's reaction, I bet you 100% that that bike frame is stolen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because otherwise he wouldn't have behaved the way he was. And he seemed to be, he seemed to be nervous when the cop was looking at it. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Who trusts cops? Maybe, maybe he's, maybe he's a friend with this guy who runs a bicycle painting. We're all honest here. Ba ba ba. I highly doubt that. Then why would you, you let him see the serial number? Yeah. (laughs) That bike was stolen. That's the simple fact of that scene. Yeah, it just wasn't his particular bicycle. Yeah. You know, and the fact that they can sneak those little details in there without ever getting close to saying anything like it is just phenomenal to me. The writing in this movie and the way that, you know, they sort of uh, sneak out like (laughs) social interactions and stuff like this is great. By the way, the other interesting thing about this entire sequence that we've been talking, that we haven't really been talking about is how the object of the bicycle changes and how that reflects on sort of the psychology of our characters, right? So um, if we're talking about the image of the bicycle, right, what is it? It's a singular object. It's very specifically his. When he goes to get it from the uh, pawn shop, it's his specific bike. He points out the frame. It's a fides, which is Latin yeah. for trust, I believe. People talk about that a lot. Ooh, um, I didn't know that. That's actually... God, I love those trucks. Um, <laughs> but anyway... It's his bicycle. There are many like it, but that one's his, right? But now when it's circulating on the black market, it becomes a little bit more ambiguous and hard to deal with as an object because it's being taken apart piece by piece, right? And cycled between hands, right? And traded between one piece to the next. And it's being like demolished and like severed into different objects that are being sent in different directions. You know what I mean? And I think it's, it's very interesting to look at that as a, also a type of image in terms of like their agency, right? And when they lack that economic security, it's sort of an interesting reflection on the psychology of what's going to happen to them. The same way that this movie does a good job of communicating the exhaustion and how little time they have to look for this and how desperate their situation is. I also think it does a good job of communicating how f- like they're going to be caught in a million different directions now, just fin- financially, right? Um, well, yeah, it's not a one-to-one relationship, but if you look at the bike as an image, it's interesting how that seems to reflect on his psychology where, I mean, how did they pay for the bike to begin with? They had to get rid of the dowry. Yeah. The bed sheets. Even before that, like it was seen as a superfluous thing before. Yeah. It was something they could sell in order to eat. Yes. But now, oh wait, now we needed to eat. Yeah. Now it's their limb. You know what I mean? It's like pawning your limb to bring up repo, you know, like it's interesting. Every movie is aspiring to be repo, the genetic cop. I mean, that's the, that's the tragic thing of repo is that it has a great premise, right? Yeah. So the, the, the interesting thing about that is how like their home now must become divided up to pay for the cost of not having this bicycle now, you know? And it's a similar way in which the bicycle itself is being divided up. Uh, It was once an object that offered him mobility from one place to the next, not just literally, but also financially, right? It wasn't just an object. All these shots, though, of just like bicycle parts and tires and everything, like it's 
and like the rain pouring down, like you can't see anything there. Yeah. Wet and miserable. Oh, this is another uh, very conspicuous moment in which this is, this is using ostensibly non neorealist tactics where they had to get a giant fire hose to do this. Yeah. I was saying this doesn't look like real rain. No, it's a very heavy rain. And also, you know, when when you shoot rain like this, you have to be able to light it and everything. I think this movie has like not typical lighting, but it has very identifiable studio lighting. It feels familiar to me. You know what I mean? It's not like they're using new wave, French new wave techniques where they're they're shooting it with like very different lighting styles. It's like this still feels lit to me in a way a studio movie is lit, except they're, they're, they are very good with their camera and they're good at setting it up and they're using it on location. Um, and part of that was born out of necessity from the neorealist movement, right? Uh, very famously, um, Rome, yeah, Rome Open City uh, was shot, supposedly. Um, oh, by the way, fun fact, one of these young men is Sergio Leone. Really? Yeah. That's <laughs> actually amazing. Yeah. Do you know which one off no, the top? No, I'm not here? sure. Uh, we need to do a Sergio Leone movie eventually. Yeah. We just have to clear our schedules for how long they are. But. <laughs> exactly. Um, I have a friend who's like, we could do a, we could do, um, he has such a short attention span when it comes to everything else. But like Sergio Leone movies are like his favorite films of all time. I'm like, how it'd be neat to do. Part of me would be like weirded out. Just like the OCD part of me would be like weirded out by not doing Yojimbo and Sanjuro together, but it would be neat to do Yojimbo and like, you know, a fistful of dollars together. A fistful of dollars is the one I would probably recommend. Um, there's this weird, I would, don't know if I want to do a podcast on it because I don't know if I have enough to say about it. What? But there's a Korean reimagining of the good, the bad and the ugly. Oh, the good, bad and the weird. Yeah. I really like it, I thought that was a good movie. It was interesting. I haven't seen it. It's, it's worth watching, I would say, but solid eight out of 10, but people, I yeah. don't know what it is, but people on the internet seem to say that that old man looks like a character from Mario. I mean, I think that's just old Italian men. I think people look at his hat and they think he looks like some sort of mushroom guy. <laughs> oh, Toadsworth. I don't know. The I old, don't know anything about Mario. It's the old mushroom guy. Okay. That's Toadsworth. All I know is that, Definitely the little boy Bruno looks like Mario in his gas station jumpsuit. And then when he goes like, bah, 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 about the dent, it's like Mario. <laughs> does he Baby work Mario. at the gas station or does he just yes. hang out there? No, he works there. Yeah. That's one of the weird things about this movie that I also think is why m people might find his character so cute is because he has a job before the dad has a job. <laughs> yeah. But that's an interesting part of their relationship. Um, like we said earlier, we can maybe speculate that the dad was away when the child was born yeah, in the war. That's that's something I, we haven't talked about yet at all is this movie doesn't really acknowledge fascism. That, no. Um, and like, like you said, the director wanted it to the primary focus to be empathy. It's just like, listen, we know, but also look how shitty life is for all these people right now. Yes. But, and you know, I think, what you're talking about is sort of been part of the new generation reading of this movie and other neorealist films that I think adds a lot of interesting dimension to them politically, where they are not necessarily overtly political films, especially this one. I think definitely the, the war trilogy is much more openly political, but this one does not declare its politics, right? <laughs> I just like his exasperation no, but here. Should we talk about that though? Yes. Although I just wanted to point it out again, uh, one thing we haven't been discussing as much either is how this movie often, despite how people frequently talk about how sad it is, it uses sort of comedic tropes and comedic techniques to keep the tones interesting throughout this middle stretch of the film. Because we are now thoroughly in the second stretch of the film where they're on their odyssey looking for the looking for the bike, right? And again, that's the moment that got them in trouble with Joseph Breen where he's going to take a piss on the wall. <laughs> Joseph Breen did not like that one bit. Um, so he got angry. But he could not... He did not have a sw enough sway to cut this movie, interestingly enough. Really? So it played in the U.S. the way it is. But anyway, one of the interesting things, since you bring that up, is how the neorealist films perform this weird, subtle distancing effect 
of the Italian sort of population's participation in fascism, right? People in the, these movies are victims of the system. But it, it also seems to imply like a very strong resistance to that system, which I do not necessarily think was the case. I'm not an expert on Italy in World War II. Okay, so, but, well, I can take my historical two cents on this um fascism as a modern movement as we know it did start in italy um they didn't go quite as insane with it as uh franco in spain and hitler in germany did i mean franco in spain never really took off that as much as the nazis did but still better than they did uh better i mean worse obviously (laughs) but Like Mussolini was like Mussolini took power in a coup. So it's not like he was like Hitler and democratically elected and the entire country was behind him, but he still was a very popular leader. Yeah. And same tactics. The, as we said, the implication is he was away for this kid's birth because he was off fighting in the war. Yes. Italy wasn't very good at fighting in wars. In fact, there's been an argument that the reason that Germany like couldn't hold down a lot of the territory in Russia is because they kept having to divert troops to fucking win Italy's battles because they started fights with countries and kept losing over and over again. Um, You cannot throw the meatballs at them. It will not work. (laughs) They, you know, they were not good. They, uh, shout outs to Ethiopia for requiring that Nazi Germany send troops to Italy in order to finally beat them down. First country to ever beat Ethiopia. Actually, Ethiopia was the only, uh, African state that was never, uh, conquered or colonized. Oh, before World War Two, fucking Germans, which is why uh, the last uh, the king of Ethiopia, Holy Cilici, is a holy figure in Rastafarianism. Yeah, there's a lot of people that, you know, just cultural movements that admire Ethiopia for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, I love that kid's exasperated look. I'm growing a devil beard. Don't shave it on my chin. I'm going to be cosplaying as Black Philip. Have you seen that movie, The Witch? It's great. But yeah, anyway, in terms of the politics of this, right? Even though it might not have been as, you know, insanely, fe- like the the civilian population being as on board with what was going on as Germany. That's not to say that they weren't involved. No, of course not. Right? Like it, a, a coup can take over the government, but like yeah. if nobody in the civilian population is okay with that, then like... You're not, you don't really have a government. In in fact, there's quite a reason for another coup to just take the government back over. Yeah. Right. Depending on the situation, but also like this move, these movies and specifically like the war trilogy, like Rome open city is about resistance fighters. Right. And in that movie, when you watch that movie, you really do not get as much of a strong indication that the soul of Italy was into that fight. It seems like they were taken hostage based on that movie. Yes, there were Italian collaborators, but it really does seem to be distancing itself from the guilt of that, you know? And I think, uh, I think this movie sort of does that in, in the same way, even though I think this movie is more specifically, you know, further after the war and focused on something different than, than Rome Open City, which is specifically about the Nazi occupation, Right. And I think it's just another interesting take on this. These types of movies is that they have that latent ideology. Yeah, no, and that's the thing. Like this movie, I like I said, I love this movie. I think it's generally entertaining. It's masterfully done, mm-hmm. but it does kind of. And I I get that. Like I can't. Po- well, no, I can possibly imagine of what if your country was taken over by a far right leader <laughs> that you have nothing to do with and you want to try to move on afterwards. Um, but this movie kind of wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to have its cake and shoot it too. Yeah. Specifically, if we're going to talk about Nazis. By the, by the way, we're just going to point out here again, we can maybe draw parallels between this scene and the scene where he's talking to the PCI party, uh, and how in both situations he's being disruptive. Right. And it's sort of a similar comparison, except in this situation, I think it is more foreboding for our main characters, because it is also kind of a vision of the future <laughs> and what awaits them if they potentially cannot get, cannot get the bicycle back. Right. 
Whereas I think the scene in the basement of the uh, complex with all the people who he lives and works with, um, there seems to be more of a like forward moving community there. You know, they have time for that play, right? People have jobs, right? Um, but the threat I think here seems to be that he's going to fall out of one type of class of people and fall into an even lower, more dependent type of class of people Yeah, where you will see here, they're so dependent that they actually lock the door, right? And not much is made of it, but technically speaking, none of these people would be able to leave if they wanted to until they're let out. You know what I mean? But, sorry, I'm distracted by that. But And in both situations, even though these institutions are offering a type of solution to the problem, they're, they're not, not delivering on it. Well, it's it's like... There's no addressing the source of the problem. Yeah, well, we have, like, yeah, we have religion, we have communism trying to do, but, like, communism is just a bunch of dudes in a room talking about just, like, oh, this is what we should do, and we've raised concerns with the labor bureau, but they're not doing anything. We have the church who are trying to provide spiritual healing to these people, and just, like, oh, we're passing out vouchers for potatoes and pasta so you can get something to eat later. Here's the other interesting thing. What do we see when he goes to the police station? Utter incompetence or just indifference. Not just that. We see them getting getting their shit together to go out. Where do you think they're going to go? No idea. They're going to go police a rally. Yeah, probably. Right? There's an interesting implication throughout this movie that not only are these institutions not necessarily, not necessarily effective in treating the cause of a real problem, it's that they're also competing with one another in different hidden ways that we don't exactly see. You know what I mean? Yeah. And ultimately, that renders their ability to to serve the people who are part of their different groups as something that's almost identical, where it's like, how well can we keep you sort of, I don't want to say on our payroll, but how much can we support you to the point where you will support us in jockeying for position of social power? And it, it's very disheartening to our characters, obviously, because there's nothing anybody can do. One thing we never really finished talking about too is is how uh, sort of the production techniques and just sort of that scene with the rain was for, at first born out of necessity. Part of the interesting thing with the movie Rome Open City and part of why I think it aesthetically is maybe a little bit more interesting than this movie. And I just mean in terms of the sheer lighting and the way the movie looks. Um, that movie was uh, shot during the occupation. They had to shoot it on the sly, right? Because they didn't necessarily want Germans coming around asking what are you shooting? Yeah. You know, um, I, I kind of want to see that now. I haven't, I'm not familiar. Oh, with I own it. It's yeah. good. It is good. I think it does a little bit more of that. <laughs> I like that moment. Uh, that's another comedy moment <laughs> that pops up throughout this. And we're going to see more hijinks too, with these two awkward people following him and they're going to do <laughs> the sign, sign of the cross. Uh, and then Bruno, because he's nervous, does it as well. <laughs> oh fuck. I better do that. Or Jesus will get mad at me. He's just a kid. He doesn't. Oh, my God. That Jesus is terrifying. Jesus is often terrifying, I say. You know what? Okay, so I saw this on the internet recently. It's something we need to bring back. Great shot. In media. What? Angels in the Bible are described like they're terrifying. They're like rotating golden circles with around flaming eyes. We need to bring that back in popular culture. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think you're looking forward to our movie for next week. Starring one Doug Jones as an ice cream man. No, not that kind of terrifying. I'm talking about like some like weird cosmic horror shit that your brain can't comprehend. Starring Doug Jones as an ice cream man. Because it's an angel ice cream man who's going to kill that little baby. <laughs> What's the name of that movie? Yeah. That's it. Lord's it, End or something. Who cares? It's the diner. It's the uh, Night of the Living Dead, but Angels. You remember that movie? Yeah, I know, but it, its name doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. It's called Umberto D. It has like some terrible like one word name, I believe. Umberto D. Definitely. Oh, we missed the moment talking about that stupid ass movie where he finally hits Bruno. It's very sad. He's at his wit's end. He's desperate. I, I, you know, I really am taken with how many different moments I feel like Bruno, how important Bruno is to just this movie's ability to play to a broad audience today. 
Because I have no doubt, like you're saying, when you finally felt like you were able to sit down and watch it on your own terms, yeah. that it played very well for you and you were for- thoroughly entertained. Um, I feel like Bruno is very important to that. And I feel like if you were to sit a lot of people in, in an auditorium and watch this as a group, that effect would be amplified. No, and he's great. Like I, I've said that before, and I'll say it again, that child actors can make or break your film. Yeah. Um, which is why you shouldn't hire the producer's kid as your <laughs> child actor. You yeah. should probably get somebody. And I feel bad for child actors because a lot of times their childhoods are warped. and Well, they don't know they want to be an actor. Yeah. You know, they th- will say they want to, but really it's just something their parent is saying. Yeah, their parents decided that they should do that. And some are really good. And like, Especially uh, in big movies. That's a really tough situation because you need your kids for those big movies, but none of those kids are ready to really put in the work, right? And No, and it makes it like the, the reason that... Stream, they may benefit from it in the end, but ultimately you don't necessarily know that's what they're going to be comfortable with oh yeah, later definitely. on. Like how are the kids from Stranger Things going <laughs> to like transition to society? Like, I mean, I'm sure a lot of them want to be actors. Yeah. But again, do they really know they want to be actors? And do they really like... Is it going to be good for them in the end? Like, I mean, they'll be set financially. Yeah, that's but, the thing. Like, out of, like think of the other like big child actor things. Uh, Dan, like the Harry Potter. Yeah, things. Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel he got Radcliffe. fucking lucky. Yeah, he he's doing still doing movies, but then like Rupert Grin. You know what he did? He bought an ice cream truck and just sort of hangs out. <laughs> And you know what? He benefited the most from that because he was able to get in and out and just do his thing. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe had that huge drinking problem. Yeah. Emma Watson was in Beauty and the Beast, I think. I don't don't know if she has any upcoming work. I thought that was good casting and then never watched that movie. Yeah. I don't watch the live action Disney remix, please. Wouldn't it be interesting if at the end of the guest, Dan Stevens turned into an animal? (laughs) Well, it did kind of fix the problem of in the original movie is that when beast turns into a human, he looks worse than he did <laughs> as a beast. <laughs> oh man. Watch that. The original I'm just Disney. imagining all the like furries getting very triggered. They're like, Oh, you fucking ruined it for this. Yeah. <laughs> for this guy. Emma Watson. There was a whole joke, just like Emma Watson confirmed as a furry <laughs> because she was talking about the original movie. And she's like, I think there's sort of a charm to him when he's the beast. <laughs> there's a sort of danger. And it's just like Emma Watson wants to fuck a furry. Oh, man. There's no way to do it correctly. Yeah. I don't know. But the, to be fair, the original Beauty and the Beast did have Gaston, the best Disney character of all time. Sure. Just toxic masculinity as a song in a very charming and fun way. Yeah, and that, then also reflecting on how the Beast is also toxic masculinity in its own special way. Kind of, but like yeah. the Beast is what you assume toxic masculinity to be. It's just like hairy and violent and evil. But Is there a revisionist reading of that movie where the Beast is an incel? Well, now that you said it, it exists. <sighs> I'm like God. I can just say things that exist. What, like the woman came to his door and he's just like, get out of here, femoid. I don't want... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. If you ever want to entertain yourself, look up incel terminology. It is utterly horrifying and will show you how far humans can fall down to the depths when they can't get laid. And for, furthermore, it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. It's the mo- like, how can you ever be an incel? It's just the most embarrassing thing ever. You can take your entire fucking philosophy from the goddamn Matrix. Well, no, not even that. But like, I hate to tell you guys, life is shit even if you do get laid. Like... If you base your entire worldview around the fact that the only way you'll be happy is if you can have sex, when you finally do get laid, because statistically it's going to happen, and you find out it didn't solve all of your life problems and you're still a miserable flesh puppet, like, I'm sorry, you you chose the wrong worldview. We just can't be talking about this. Yeah, of course we can. Especially while they're eating. It's going to make them throw up retroactively in the movie. What's going to be around in the future? Oh, Christ. But this scene is obviously very touched with a hint of tragedy. And I think a lot of the scenes in this are. There's there's always a light comedic moment to this stretch of the movie, right? Yeah. But it's always, you, again, you can never forget. Never forget that it's it's just not true, you know? This isn't going to hide them from the reality of what's happening. This isn't a pizzeria. It's considered low class. But... 
The kid feels bad because he's not. Now, how old do you think this kid is? He's drinking wine? Yeah, you. It's an Italy thing, I guess. Yeah, no. You, you, in France and Italy and whatnot, you start drinking when you're a small child. Do you think we'd be better people if we'd done that? Yes. I, I mean, you and I, specifically. Yes. Um, <laughs> but to be fair, France, Italy, all of Europe has significantly lower drunk driving rates per capita because they just introduce alcohol to kids when they're young so they don't go crazy with it when they're teenagers. Here in America, we do everything the worst. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Including our podcasts. I hope you're enjoying this so far. Yes, the Italian podcast of this was much, much better. <laughs> you know, this guy, that guy looks a lot like French Ramy from Lady Abelique. And I really cannot put my thumb down on what that line is supposed he kinda, to be. You know who he reminds me of? What? He kind of reminds me of the uh, original Adam's Family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> John Astin? Not that, but just like the original like look of that Oh, character. the cartoon? Yeah. <laughs> That's not very nice, Max. Oh, come on. (laughs) I have no ill will to any of the Adams family. They're all beautiful people, and we should all strive to be like them. You knew Angelica Houston was in John Wick 3. I'll get around to watching the John (laughs) Wick movies, okay? (laughs) I'll do it. I love Keanu Reeves. He seems like a splendid person, and I want to support him. But Oh, man, that's the way you got to eat that Gorgon's I'm fucking starving now. (laughs) God. It does look really good. You know what's worse is that the rich family is going to comically just order a whole nother round of food. Yeah. It's absurd. Who does that? Uh, people who are trying to get the pores out of their restaurant. <laughs> they're just going to eat so much and then get liposuction for all the food they've just eaten while they're eating. Yeah. No, it's a service they offer. And we got champagne. You'll never have as much as them. God, that kid looks like a fucking John Waters nightmare. <laughs> I was just talking about John Waters earlier. We need to get around to doing a John Waters movie already. That'd be a challenge to do a commentary track of, but I'm down. I don't I don't know if it would be, honestly. I think we'd just have to take it in a different angle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a challenge I'm willing to accept. I'm going to put it that way. But Jesus Christ, the scene makes me so hungry and I don't know why. Because, like, you've just been desperately searching and everything's terrible. And then you finally get this moment of just like, oh, we're eating. We're trying to pretend to be normal. Yeah. And it's like, oh. Pardon us, everybody. The jet just flew overhead. They can't hear it. Oh, okay. Every time we point it out, they can never hear it. (laughs) Just ignore it and act like it's not happening. Just like this guy was trying to do with this meal. Oh, and here's another interesting detail where we're going to see that actually Antonio doesn't even know math, right? Or at least he's not literate in the way that his son is. And again, I think that's an interesting part of the whole story that we haven't really talked about yet is how ultimately this movie, even though I believe Vittorio De Sica was a big communist, uh, a big communist, that sounds like something some, communist. some dumbass Republican would... He's a big communist, that guy. No, it's it's the... Rapper of, hey, I'm Biggie Commie. <laughs> oh, my God. But uh, you're supposed to leave that type of shit for me to say. I mean, Jesus. We, we each get a stupid ration. Uh, but, you know, he was a big communist. But uh, ultimately, the interesting thing about this movie is how it is mourning their inability to operate in a system that the communists would say is fundamentally broken. Right. I mean, what is the bike, if not a representation of their ability to be upwardly mobile into a class of people that is comfortable with this arrangement, right? Yeah. As we're going to see soon enough after they leave this person's, the, uh, what what should we call her? Soothsayer? A witch? I don't want to call her a witch. A medium. Yes, the medium. We're going to leave the medium, then we're going to see Alfredo, who also has some troubles, and he's perhaps in a more dire situation than even our heroes. Right? Yeah. But this movie is ultimately about the tragedy of him stealing their future to live more comfortably. You know what I mean? If you really boil it down to the ideology, it's not that they're living comfortably to begin with, right? But it's not like he has a job beforehand and they were still finding a way to do it. And it's not like he's resorted to thievery before. But also that scene, like, we just see, like, no matter how hard he tries, and even though he was just like, this is an amazing job, this is, like, I was, we were going to 
do it great. Like he was still never going to be like that rich family, just no gorging themselves over there. Or speaking of rich, look at this family. I think part of the way they organize this shot is very del- deliberate to me. I think there's a uh, an interesting staging technique in this film. Oh, the, well, he's she's gonna, she's gonna say something so harsh to this young boy. L- Liz and Max, look, you're ugly. You're ugly, my boy. <laughs> His face is so sad. Oh my god. So your seeds in a different field. Now pay me. Yes, I called you ugly. But look at this woman, right? So she has lost lots of uh, sort of Christian paraphernalia throughout her apartment, right? And uh, we're going to see, I think, that she has a lot of money, right? And uh, to bring it back to Repo, the genetic opera, right? I think an interesting... The basis for all our film criticism, right. honestly. But I believe one lyric that I recall thinking was interesting from that movie was how when he's singing at the beginning... Um, He's singing about for every market, a sub-market grows. Yes. Was the line, right? And I think an interesting sort of similar idea is at play here, right? Where there is no institution that can really address the problem, so we turn to pure fantasy and uh, sort of, what would you call this? What's the term? Superstition. Thank you. Even the dog is like, hey, we were here first. Yeah. I mean, good on this woman, I guess, for tricking everybody out of their own money to make a yeah, living in this. But ultimately, the interesting thing about this is how uh, is how this also forms a type of community, right? But ultimately, his family isn't really part of any sort of community, right? We have the party as a community, we have these people as a community, and then we have the church, right? But his family is is trying to remain independent, but ultimately they can't really integrate with any community. Even in this one, they're disruptive of the way it's supposed to be because of their personal needs, right? But no community really helps them. This is ultimately the one that comes closest because at least they fucking talk to them, right? But still, they don't give them any help. Like, that's what they've been trying to do. Yeah, not really, right? Oh, she's too good to touch the money. Yes, it's very, very interesting touch. One thing we also haven't been talking about is uh, how much I think this movie excels at a term that I don't like using, and that's world building. And part of the reason I don't like using that term and part of the reason I think it's stupid in, in how it's generally used is because it's never applied to movies like this, and, then, and yet this movie is one of the most successful to ever do that. Well, I think a lot of times because it's used in fictional worlds. Yes. Like, because... Post World War II Italy was a real place and it existed, and we're filming in it right now so yes. we can get a good idea of it. But at the same time, like, I don't know, I, I don't hate the term as much as you. I just think that, like, part of the reason why this movie excels at doing that is, again, our conversation about how this is not literally just documentary stuff, but also, like, they had to create this reality using artifice much in the same way that you would create a reality using artifice in any sort of fictional film. Yeah. Right? Get them. Beat the shit out of them. Oh, and we're going to see them run into the brothel. (laughs) Every good movie needs a brothel chase through scene. It's weird how they, like, enter through the bathroom, but whatever. I'm not going to complain. I've never been to an Italian brothel. I don't know what it's like. But where did the guy go? And again, part of the reason why I think this movie is interesting is because it really provides those moments of awkwardness where social, like, contracts are kind of violated in the name of the bike, you know? It's very different from what you would expect from a Hollywood version of this movie. Yeah, you know, you'd have a much wackier sequence in a yeah. Hollywood version. Also, the fact that it's it's a brothel and they don't even have to say it. <laughs> well, 
Also, I didn't notice this before, but it's interesting if you look at the cutouts on the wall. It's very strange detail. <laughs> yes, it's a very Italian moment. Max, what do you think of this guy, Alfredo? Overall. I think he's a human. That's like kind of all you can say about him at the end. Does he aggravate though you though? Who's I guess I'm asking like it's not like this movie is asking you to choose sides between who like who you really go with. Um but like who do you end up feeling more empathy for? Do you think Bruno? Oh, more so than either of these two guys? Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Bruno's just along. He's working. He's six years old. He has to get up early in the morning to go work at a gas station. He has to deal with his dad's insane fucking thing to get a bike back, which he lost because he's. And here's the other interesting thing, right? Where we really get this glimpse into the other community from which Alfredo is a part of, right? Where immediately he's being he's sort of ambushed in this community, but everybody's going to surround him and exonerate him for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is a different type of sort of poverty. Oh, I like that baby's hat. And this is, oh God, that guy in the left is th frightening. This is a different type of poverty from, uh, from the type that we're seeing with Antonio and the people in his sort of apartment complex, right? And we're going to see this guy with the glasses walk up. And this is very clearly sort of mafiosa law is going on here, right? This is a different situation where communal law now trumps official law. And that's why this group of people is like, like very discernibly of a different class than Antonio. Yeah. You know? And we know that these guys are criminals because this guy walks up in a yeah. fucking suit and tie, you know? With the fucking really gelled styled hair. And since we know that people helped Alfredo steal the bike, we know that these people are also helping him get away with it. Yeah, of course. It's an inherently frustrating situation for Antonio to be in. <laughs> I'm surprised this mob hasn't already beat the shit out of him. They're going to say it too. Yeah. Probably because they're threatening the, the police, but then this happens. And here's another interesting question that people tend to debate is how authentic do you think he's being when he's having this sort of seizure? Yeah, I don't know. I'm biased toward that <laughs> as somebody who seizes themselves. I also believe that it's really going on based on the, the mother. Yeah. But also, it is interesting in the mother's performance, she does cast her eyes up towards Antonio several times, right? Don't hit his head, looks at Antonio. Don't hit his head, yeah. looks at Antonio. It's interesting. Hey, It's now, it's just sort of, even if it was the guy who stole his bike, like. Well, yeah. it is. We yeah. know it is. Yeah. And then they begin threatening him. <laughs> but it's interesting, right? I think, uh, oh, and now we're going to get the cop. And now they're going to gaslight everything and everybody's going to disperse and, and say that this guy was attacked. But again, part of the interesting thing going on here is how uh, when we talk about Bicycle Thieves and the title and also what happens with the bike and how it's sort of a dissolution of autonomy and identity, um, we're going to see progressively throughout the film like uh, the dissolution of um, Antonio's quote unquote clean identity and, and, uh, he'll become one of them, meaning one of the bicycle thieves. You yeah. know what I mean? He's going to be no better. You can't pull yourself up by the bootstraps without dirtying your boots a little bit first. Yes, exactly. And I think it's this movie because it's so much like does a good job of making you triggered by the bicycle being stolen. Yeah. You're very much willing to step into that and, and sort of distance yourself from the person who's the thief, right? Such as the, we're so in tune to Antonio's plight that the people who steal the bicycles are very much easy to be the antagonist here, even when they're humanized, right? 
But ultimately, when he becomes the one who ends up stealing a bicycle, that reversal is so satisfying because you're so willing to buy into his plight in the first place. You know, it's the ultimate tragedy is that you have to become the person who damaged you in this way in order to actually have a shot at regaining that. Maybe it's behind that thing cover. And again, I think this mother's performance is excellent in this movie. You see any bicycles? And she does it with such a practiced confidence that you know this is just this is just the way it is. Yeah. But again, this is a new type of of poverty, right, that we're being shown. Uh people have called this old world poverty. Um, and, and the idea that they're all living in one room opposed to Antonio's apartment, which is multiple rooms at the very least, right? Different situation. And also one interesting thing that's going on here and something we've talked about is how much people in this sort of community t- seem to be occupying the public space as if it was private space. You know, for lack of their own private space, they are pushed into the public space. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they have one room to themselves and the family, and then they, they're they hanging around on the streets and everything. It's an interesting difference from the uh, the people we've seen so far. And I think it recontextualizes how much money and resources Antonio and his family actually have. Not Not to say that they have a lot, right? But it shows a different type of future in store for them or a different type of... Uh, I don't know, a community available to people who are struggling, right? And I think it informs a lot about different types of behaviors going on at this point in time. Yeah, this movie doesn't really leave you feeling anything good. You just kind of... I mean, it is interesting. It makes you feel sad and bad, yeah. but also there's it's such an exercise in empathy that I think there's something cathartic about that, you know, about the ability to just turn off your own life and empathize with someone on screen so completely, you know, I think it's a very interesting thing that happens. Yeah. Don't say that in front of a cop. (laughs) Probably not the best idea. The interesting thing is how the cop seems to actually believe him. No, I think the cops just sort of, or maybe a, being placating him. Yeah. Just being like, listen, even if you are right, you have to do this and this because that's the way things are. The other interesting detail that they pointed out that we haven't really discussed too much is the fact that Alfredo is wearing a German hat. Yeah. A German army hat yes. specifically. It's Which a I'm very a, interesting detail. A bunch were probably left over. Yeah. You know he did it. And now he just has to leave. (laughs) I don't know how, like, since yesterday, I forgot about just the mobsters and suits and this crowd of rabble. And then jeering him. Yeah. It's the ultimate, most defeating moment. Like, I know I'm right, but there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. No, Dad, I'm joining the mob. And God, this is such great just on location photography. I think that's the other thing too, that really sells the aesthetic of the neorealist films is like, they're not afraid to use a very specific type of hard lighting. Right. And to make things look very dry and sweaty and unclean. So here we are, Max, we have Uh, arrived at the final stretch of the movie. The final bit of just, I'm defeated. There's nothing I can do. I've... They're not necessarily going to steal the bike right away, but no. we are definitely at the wit's end. And ultimately, I think it's very important that we confront Alfredo in this movie because for several reasons. One, because I think it's important to to uh, sort of have that element there where we're talking about the dialectic between one versus many, right? And how every object we see in this movie has that story and the suffering that goes along with it. And how... Since it is plural bicycle thieves, we have to really plant the the sympathy and empathy we have for Alfredo and his situation before he is ready to become a thief, right? 
that's very important because now that we understand their motivations. Well, yeah. And it's also, it's reminding you that like, cause we've been suffering along with this character the entire movie. It's just like he, there are still people who have it worse than him. Yeah. And probably worse than the others too. Yeah. I, I think that's another thing that people would associate with this being neo realist is its ability to defer your ability to judge people. Yeah. You know, since it is so empathetic, it's like, we're not going to let you have an easy time of pointing your finger at somebody, even when you know that they're the one that did it, you know? Oh, poor Bruno. And regardless how frustrating it is, right? It's not like you can sort of, I don't know. Oh God. And now we're, now we're calling back to that shot where he's going up to the medium for the first time with his wife, right? Bicycles left alone. Yes. It's like, how could you possibly leave that alone? It's drawing on the same feeling, you know? And we see, Oh God, it's just so tantalizing and awful. Yeah. But the other interesting thing that sets up this moment is like it's the last logical plot conclusion, right? When we confront the guy that we know stole the bike and he still can't get it back, now it's over, right? Yeah. There's no hope of like getting the bike back if the person you know took it. You just confronted them and you can't do it. Even like if this movie was Hollywood, it would be like the gangsters would just be like, listen. We're not going to, as long as you don't come around our neighborhood anymore. Here, look, we, we found a bike outside. Isn't that interesting? Literally. There would be some alternative yeah. other than them being deferred a type of satisfaction. You know what I mean? And that's the, the ultimate interesting thing about this movie is how it, it defers things that happen rather than trying to set something up and then pay it off in a dramatic way. You could try to have this movie with the same plot points and say it in a very similar way. Uh, make it in a similar way and do it in a Hollywood way. But I think what it would do is it would try to set up dramatic moments. You know what I mean? Because it would make you frustrated about the theft and then try to pay that off and satisfy the frustration that it's been building up, you know? Yeah. And this movie never tries to satisfy your frustration. It just exasperates it. (laughs) And it's very important for scenes like this. And by the time that we get all these shots... This is just an excellent sequence of just like it's now or shot never. reverse shot, right? And we just know that we're we're here with this decision. We're not necessarily on board with what he's going to do. But we understand why he's going to. Yes, we ultimately, everything that has come up in this movie has ultimately led us to this, this huh. decision. Just do it, you fucker. And we can also, we also empathize with Bruno. Yeah. Right? Who looks up at his dad and we know for a fact that he is not as knowledgeable as we are right now. Yeah. What kind of adult is Bruno going to grow into up to be? A sober one. Let's hope so. The first time I got drunk was the worst day of my life. <laughs> my dad proved himself to be a disgrace. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, like everybody in this movie, like, is there a good person in this movie besides Bruno? No, and I, that's also something that you see as a through line of neorealist movies because children represent a type of like innocence, and but like objective innocence. Yeah, you know, the mind of a child can like cut to the heart of a situation morally, and this is the sequence where you learn that he just sucks at riding bicycles, and ultimately the thing that screws him over compared to other people is that he doesn't have that network of people to support him. And now everyone's after him. <gasps> oh no! Dun, dun, dun. Oh no! Wait a second. That's just Anthony Perkins. Okay, whatever. He does look like him, doesn't he? Uh, kinda. Yeah, I can see that. It's a little bit weird. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> Trying to ruin everything. It's the same line. And this is just the most dramatic moment of the movie. He's getting slapped and he can't do anything about it. And this Uh, is the completion of the film. What a melancholy way to end. 
And now he has to be the man of the family. It is interesting that you have that reversal. One thing we haven't really talked about too much is the way in which uh, Bruno and and uh, and Antonio sort of switch roles as father and son figures. Yeah. Where there's this weird thing where like now Bruno is going to get Antonio out of trouble, you know? Mm, yeah. And he's the one that has the the wage, <laughs> you know. It's a very strange situation. Well, also, I think it, it, it does help speak to, like, the social issues going on. <laughs> and again, we also get that ultimate emotional moment. It is w- somehow weirdly worse that he lets him go in a specific way. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's just, he's going to rot in his own suffering he's no better than the guy who took it It, or it's because the guy who sees his son whose bike he tried to steal understood completely what he was going through it's like he's now stealing from himself 100 percent. you know it's different from somebody who's never had their bike stolen before but you know we've been setting it up so perfectly this entire movie that everybody's bike is going to have this backstory to it and based on the reaction that's true of the person whose bike he tries to steal right so when he acknowledges that and says, oh, you can let him go. I don't want trouble. It's like, it's awful because he's just, he just is the person who did this to himself. You they, know, they look fucking traumatized. Both of them. Yeah, it is really sad. And this is going to be the final ending of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. And, and famously there's a anecdote about how one of the things that Vittorio De Sica did to help Bruno cry on this day, the actor that played Bruno is that he planted a pack of cigarettes on his clothes and then accused him of him stealing. And when the kid was like, no, I didn't do it. And then they found the pack of cigarettes on him. He freaked out and started crying. Aww. Which is really sad. I don't know if that's true, though. I mean, that kid did, did look like genuinely like, no. Nah. <laughs> what a... You need to stop playing with your microphone stand. Yep. But uh, yeah, so that's bike, Bicycle Thieves. And very appropriately, we end with them going into the crowd. He has become one of them. Everybody is, you know, yeah. one of the bicycle thieves. And uh, because we were at that place with him when he was making the decision, the movie has also kind of made us bicycle thieves as well. So maybe we were the bicycle thieves. The, the real bicycles time. were the thieves we met along the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> great way to put it. The, the, okay. Yeah. Hi. So uh, that was the spectator <laughs> film podcast. You but, can, uh, I, you know, I think, I think not a bad episode. I think, uh, this movie, obviously you can just go on forever about this movie. Um, and the fact that there's so many resources, I think help take the pressure off of us. Why for this. I wasn't as sad when I watched it yesterday <laughs> because when you really do think about it and you're there with him, it's, it's a very, I guess defeating... I was watching it in more of an abstract sense of more just like, I was very much looking yeah. through the lens of post-World War II Italy. Yeah. And I was like, all of these people could be fascists, so I'm not really <laughs> going to be that. <laughs> but Bruno isn't. Bruno isn't. Yes. Bruno ultimately. deserves better. And all, and I think part of the answer to your question from the beginning is, you know, why do some of these film film school one on one movies? Why do, are, why are some better than the rest? Why are some, you know, maybe you can have an easier time of interacting with them after or engaging with them on your own terms. And yeah. I think it does come down to a certain type of personal interaction. If you can find the space for that like personal connection to a movie, you're going to find that it escapes the film school one-on-one thing. And you, you can, know, you can find they relate to it as a human rather than a student. And this movie is very much humanist in that way. Yes. It is 100% focused on getting you to that point where you can empathize. Regardless of political ideology and whatnot, I think there is just sort of just like a human quality to just like trying your hardest for something and just, it wasn't enough at the end. Yeah, and and the idea that how much the world around you is going to play into your ability to just get that one thing. Yeah. You know, and how much of of a difference that one thing can make for you when you feel desperate, you know, and the idea of options available to you. Uh, Yeah, there's there's really so much to say about this movie that there's almost nothing for us to say about it at this point. Because look in our show notes, please. This movie is just, it's just, about so many different things and it's so immaculately made, you know, um, there's so many interesting stories about the production of it and how De Sica, you know, was not, 
he started as an actor and had this very specific style directing. Um, in the entire history of the neorealist movement, it's one of the most important film movements in history, right? So obviously this is, I, one of the things for our podcast is our approach is never to have the final word about a movie, but our hope is to sort of start conversation more so than end conversation in any yeah. of our episodes. And I think this definitely is something that would be true for this movie. I mean, yeah, we can have conversations, but that's between the two of us. We want you guys to start talking about this movie and what you think. Um, yeah. But, you know, also one thing we should add, we watched the Criterion edition of this movie. So uh, I will recommend the Criterion edition. Well, and it does have subtitles because it's in a foreign language. Yes. Um, the Blu-ray is very high quality. It's great. But also there's a little bit of like a bit, bit of regret because the DVD box set was awesome, too. It came with a bunch of essays, one by Charles Burnett, one by Andre Bazan, I oh, guess. Oh, is that what you were reading before? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really awesome booklet. So either one of those is good, even if the DVD transfer is not quite the same level as the Blu-ray. But awesome movie. Uh, we have completed Bicycle Thieves. Cool. We can add that to our list. If you want to see other movies on our list, you can check the Spectator Film Podcast out on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. We also have a letterbox if you want to look at that. Yeah, we're on spectatorfilmpodcast.com. And Max, I know just the way to end this episode. Oh, wow.